Good afternoon. Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations will now come to order, and the chair recognizes himself for a five-minute opening statement. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's hearing. The subcommittee previously held a hearing on how quickly how to quickly identify the root cause of a disease outbreak. Today's hearing will examine biosafety practices at high containment laboratories handling dangerous pathogens. We will focus on addressing whether advancements in biotech have outpaced our existing biosafety guidelines and whether or not we are following those guidelines. The NIH clearly did not enforce those guidelines with research being done for it by EcoHealth Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology into novel coronaviruses. Our examination of biosafety has to be informed by the real possibility that a pandemic which killed over one million Americans was the result of an incident at a laboratory that received NIH funding. As I have said at past hearings, I believe the available evidence favors COVID-19 emerging due to a lab-related incident. My belief that COVID-19 came from a lab leak is now shared by the Department of Energy and the FBI. But regardless of our individual opinions as to the origins of COVID-19, we in Congress have a responsibility to understand the potential benefits and perils of this type of research. As the Committee with Authorizing Jurisdiction over Federal Biomedical Research, all of us here today have a special responsibility to grapple with these issues. High containment biosafety labs are expensive and complex to build, maintain, and run. Research conducted in these laboratories involves pathogens that can cause serious, potentially life-threatening diseases, and in the case of biosafety level 4, BSL-4, laboratories diseases which for which no vaccine or therapy exists. It is crazy to me that the Wuhan Institute of Virology appears to have conducted at least some high-risk coronavirus research at a biosafety level two lab and did so with U.S. dollars. In 2000, there were less than 10 BSL-4 labs in the world. There are now 59 in operation, under construction, or planned. In the United States alone, there are over 1,500 biosafety level three facilities. Rapid advances in biotechnology have opened up potential new cures and expanded our scientific knowledge. But this has also led to the proliferation of new technologies and research techniques that are inherently dual use and potentially dangerous if done in inappropriate biosafety conditions. Balancing safety with innovation is an enduring challenge. Our existing oversight framework for risky research isn't working. Whether we call it gain of function research or whether it's called research with enhanced potential pandemic pathogens, I fear we have not kept pace. The United States doesn't have a comprehensive regulatory system for high containment laboratories. Practically speaking, the research institutions, companies, and universities that operate these facilities police themselves. Back in 2017, the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy issued guidance the potential pa pandemic pathogen care and oversight framework, but it was intended to apply to all executive agencies. However, it has only been implemented by one department, Health and Human Services. And HHS has largely delegated implementation to the NIH, a funding entity who has shown a lack of significant oversight towards risky research with their grantee EcoHealth Alliance and subgrantee Wuhan Institute of Virology. As the debacle with EcoHealth Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology makes clear, NIH is neither inclined nor equipped to exercise oversight of the risky research it funds within the United States or abroad. NIH is not only indifferent but reflexively hostile to outside oversight. NIH has stonewalled and slow-walked our, our document requests related to EcoHealth Alliance grants. Further, how many accidents at high containment labs go unreported. There does not appear to be a government-wide effort to understand the frequency and nature of laboratory accidents. Since last October, NIH has not provided key information about an in-house National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease gain-of-function experiment involving a highly lethal clade of monkeypox. NIH won't even tell us about its deliberations about this experiment. It makes me wonder what the NIH has to hide. How bad is it? when they won't even engage with the authorizing committee about this information. We have to assume there's something they don't want us to know about. Perhaps something very, very dangerous. I'll conclude my opening remarks by noting that the highest ranking NIH official, Dr. Larry Tabak, appeared before this committee in February. 
in response to questions about NIH's failure to enforce biosafety measures it placed on coronavirus research it funded at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, Dr. Tabak testified the NIH is not an enforcement agency. I'm beginning to think he's right. It may be time for us in Congress to relieve the NIH of the burden of conducting risky research at institutions that it funds. I yield back. I now recognize the ranking member of, the, of this subcommittee, Ms. Castor, for her five minutes for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. There are two important complementary priorities that I look forward to discussing with our witnesses today. Uh, the first is to make sure that we're advancing science and research so that we can better protect Americans from disease, uh, achieve scientific breakthroughs, and continue to lead the world in innovation and discovery. The second is to ensure that the safety standards governing, governing our nation's research continue to protect the public and the scientists and researchers involved. Extensive oversight and safety requirements already exist in our research centers today, and I hope that our witnesses can help us better understand that and how we can continue to modernize. Americans can be proud of the U.S.-led research in laboratories in the United States and across the world, including with infectious diseases and pathogens. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we relied on this research to spur vaccine development in record time. And each year, researchers across the globe collaborate to study seasonal influenza so that we can better develop vaccines to protect the public based on real-time data in other nations. And when more infectious flu variants, like the avian flu, emerge, we depend on our researchers to go into high containment labs to study ways to prevent death and disease. And as we'll discuss at tomorrow's hearing, uh, viral research is critical to helping us prepare for and address the emerging threat of antimicrobial resistance. Because this research is so important, Congress should support thoughtful, constructive steps to ensure that it is being conducted safely. We must remain the gold standard of biosafety standards internationally and continue to improve and modernize. I hope to have a constructive discussion about those potential improvements in this committee and ensure that any new policies we consider include input from key stakeholders in the research community. Uh, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have floated broad bans on international collaboration without considering what that would mean for flu surveillance, uh, for vaccine development, or monitoring viruses. Many of these proposed research restrictions and criticisms target research in other countries, including some countries where viral outbreaks have originated in the past. But disease knows no borders. Uh, since I've come to Congress, we've had to address global outbreaks of MERS, Zika, Ebola, and of course COVID-19 and its changing variants. These viruses are threats to everyone, and it's critical that our scientists can partner with public health experts to identify and stop potential pandemics. The administration's national biodefense strategy recognizes the need for America to galvanize support for multinational biosafety commitments so that research in foreign countries can be done safely and up to the, high, the same high standards that we use in our labs at home. I also sit on the Select Committee on the Strategic Competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party, where we are focused on the threat posed by the CCP and on a plan of action to defend the American people, our economy, and our values. I can tell you that if America does not lead the world in infectious disease research, the CCP will try to fill that role. If we don't continue to engage and collaborate with the international research community, advise where appropriate on development of labs, and export our best practices in training on lab safety, the CCP will fill that void for sure. And if they do, we will have little transparency into what work is being done uh, and how. Overbroad funding bans will not accomplish our goals and could have detrimental impacts on future medical advancements and scientific breakthroughs. Any discussion we have must be done in a thoughtful manner. 
uh, with the input of people who actually conduct research on da dangerous pathogens every day. No one has a greater stake in lab safety than researchers working in American labs. These are the people who do the hard work to develop groundbreaking proposals, study how viruses grow and mutate, and make sure we are protected from the next viral outbreak. I trust that we can support these researchers by forging a bipartisan path forward on lab safety that does, uh, doesn't stifle the research and international collaboration that all Americans rely on to protect their health and safety. So I look forward to our discussion today. I yield back my time. Jane Lee yields back. Now I recognize the chair of the full committee, Ms. McMorris Rogers, for her five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With several new books out this week about lab accidents, a recently released Senate report with new details pointing to safety problems at the Wuhan lab, and the recent recommendations of an NIH advisory panel on oversight of risky research, this hearing is timely. Not to mention the terrifying news that fighters in Sudan have seized the country's national laboratory for public health, which holds samples of risky and deadly diseases, including measles, polio, and cholera, which the World Health Organization has said is a huge biological risk. This is especially worrisome, considering the CDC has supported this national lab since 2006, including its biosafety protocols, lab quality management and, and infrastructure, and staff trainings. As recently as 2018, CDC helped to establish the first viral load monitoring facility at this lab. This is a very dangerous situation that we must monitor closely. We still do not know how the COVID-19 pandemic started. However, more information has heightened our suspicions that the origin of the pandemic was linked to a lab incident. It raises the importance of our work to oversee, oversee biosafety of risky research. Unfortunately, in our pursuit of solutions, the conduct of some public health officials and the loss of trust in our public health institutions hampered our response. Instead of openness and honest discussion, HHS and NIH have persisted in foot dragging, stonewalling, or flat out refusing to engage in legitimate questions. Today, the NIH still won't provide meaningful information or straight answers to the committee about how the P3CO framework governing risky research was developed or who at the NIH was responsible for developing the framework. An NIH advisory panel earlier this year found the framework had too many loopholes and too much flexibility to evade independent review. We still do not have complete information about NIH experts in 2016, how they allowed EcoHealth Alliance, through its subgrantee, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, to proceed with a research proposal infecting humanized mice with experimental coronavirus strains. NIH and EcoHealth agreed to go forward with the experiment on the condition that if excessive virus growth occurred, EcoHealth would immediately stop the experiment and notify the NIH. This condition was incorporated into the grant terms. The experiment went forward. There was excessive virus growth, but immediate stoppage and notification did not occur. This was the conclusion of both the NIH and the Office of Health and Human Services Inspector General. Under other circumstances, EcoHealth's failure to stop the experiment and immediately notify the NIH could be described as a near-miss safety incident. However, we have no way of knowing whether it was a lucky break with no incident or a lab experiment gone wrong. NIH has no way of knowing because EcoHealth committed another failure. It did not obtain the laboratory notebooks and electronic files from Wuhan Lab. Yet even with these compliance failures, NIH continues to hold EcoHealth to good standing and continues to provide them even more funding. No changes in policy, no lessons learned, no consequences, no accountability, no seriousness from the NIH. No wonder the credibility of the NIH has suffered. Even after spending $1 billion in taxpayer dollars on public relations, we're going to get to the bottom of that, too. The American people deserve answers and accountability. 
Dr. Fauci, admitting in the New York Times, quote, something clearly went wrong is not going to cut it. As we learned today, we have gaps in biosafety policy and oversight. However, even addressing these gaps will not be sufficient if the NIH only pays lip service to biosafety compliance with no real commitment to implementation. The path forward to restoring public health is having good faith, honest discussion. We need critical research for cures and, me and medical countermeasures. For years, this committee and especially this subcommittee have held oversight hearings about lab accidents and other mishaps. The risk side still has not been adequately dealt with. Today's hearing can be a, constru a constructive start. And I thank the witnesses for being here, for your participation, and especially participating on short notice. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for his five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. When the coronavirus pandemic began, many researchers with the training and experience to examine dangerous viruses put their research on hold to tackle the pandemic. The lab infrastructure that was in place and the research community were essential in identifying the virus, how it worked, and how we could slow its spread and limit its ability to harm Americans. And the public saw the benefits of this research in real time, with vaccinations becoming available at an unprecedented pace. So we'll hear a lot today about the risk of certain kinds of research, and it's important that we examine those risks. At the same time, we need to understand the benefits of certain research in preventing and responding to pandemics, and we also need to discuss the training and safety measures that are already in place in high containment labs to reduce risk. Thanks to the investments that have been made in research, the scientific community was able to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in record time. This included scientists at our public institutions as well as those in the private sector. It was a global effort to solve a global problem, and we should take immense pride in, to the extent and quality of America's scientific contributions towards understanding and addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the many lessons that we should take away from the pandemic is that a well-resourced and well-trained scientific community is essential if we have any hope of preventing and defeating future pandemics. Now, studying dangerous pathogens requires carefully considered protocols and persistent oversight to ensure that the work is conducted safely. When it comes to risk, it's the researchers working in high containment labs. Are they the ones with the most to lose when labs are not adequately maintained or corners are cut or safety protocols are insufficient? They're, one, they're the ones who are literally in the room with dangerous pathogens so they can study how the pathogens threaten us and how we can protect ourselves. So we must ensure that scientists feel free to speak up about any concerns they have that could help improve lab safety. But I'm very concerned that the tenor of the current debate on lab safety is having a chilling effect on scientific research and among the scientists at the forefront of disease prevention and response. We have seen scientists, including some of our top public health officials, maligned, marginalized, taken out of context, and accused of covering up the origins of COVID-19. And these actions are harmful and counterproductive because we must have scientists at the table if we want to stay world leaders in science and research, and if we want researchers to feel comfortable raising safety concerns. So I'm pleased we have a witness at the table today who can help us understand, I should say witnesses at the table today, who can help us understand what's working well already and where there may be a need for additional transparency, consistency and safety, regulation or oversight. The Biden administration and House Democrats have taken important steps towards increasing biosafety and biosecurity. Last year's Consolidated Appropriations Act contained numerous important provisions to improve biosafety, but no Republican on this committee vote that's here today supported that legislation. And just yesterday, the House Republican majority jammed through their Default on America Act that would strip funding from important programs that could assist with pandemic preparedness and biosafety. It also strips COVID-19 treatment and vaccine development funds and threatens U.S.-based medical manufacturing. With this legislation, House Republicans, I believe, are threatening a default crisis that would devastate everyday Americans. So I hope today's hearing demonstrates why continuous investment rather than misguided funding cuts is essential to prevent pandemics and respond swiftly when they occur. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. 
Thank the gentleman for yielding back. That concludes member opening statements. I would like to remind mem members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. We want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today and taking your time to testify before the subcommittee. Each witness will have an opportunity to give an opening statement followed by a round of questions from the members. Our witnesses today are Dr. Rocco Casagrande, Executive Chairman of Gryphon. Did I say that right? Scientific. Dr. Robert Hawley, former Chief of Safety and Radiation Protection Division of the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute, Fort Detrick. Dr. Gregory Koblitz, Associate Professor and Director of Biodefense Graduate Programs for George Mason uh, University. Andy uh, Pekash, Professor of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology, Johns Hopkins University. We appreciate you being here today and I look forward to hearing from you all on this important issue. As you are aware, the committee is holding an oversight hearing, and when we do so, we have the practice of taking our testimony under oath. Do any of you have objections to testifying under oath today? Seeing no objections, we'll proceed. The chair advises you are also entitled to be advised by counsel pursuant to House rules. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during your testimony today? Seeing uh, that none uh, have requested counsel, please, if each of you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. All have responded uh, in the affirmative. Seeing that all witnesses have responded in the affirmative, you're now sworn in under oath, subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. With that, uh, we will now recognize Dr. Rocco Casagrande for five minutes to give an opening statement. But before you begin your opening statement, if you would introduce your two high-level staff assistants who have come with you today, I see them sitting behind you. Thank you. My senior advisors are Jack and Kennedy. I hope that doesn't make my comments too partisan. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not taken that way at all. But uh, we welcome your senior advisors to be with us today, and we're glad that they're here. If you would now proceed with your five minutes of uh, opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored that you invited me to speak about such a timely and important topic as laboratory safety. Today I'm going to advocate for several improvements that are critically needed to ensure that the laboratories that study the most deadly and transmissible viruses remain safe. This research is essential to prevent and respond to pandemics of the future. However, it is not without risks. The practice of mitigating such risks is called biosafety. Historically, biosafety has been perceived as consuming time and money that would otherwise be spent on critical research. But I'm also going to argue that needed improvements in biosafety will not stifle or draw away resources, but will help improve the efficiency of the research enterprise if implemented properly. The critical improvements that I will talk about today can be grouped into six categories. Oversight, research, standards, workforce, resources, and mission. Regarding oversight, biosafety authority in the U.S. derives from a patchwork of regulations, laws, and guidance given the pathogen research or the source of funding. Currently, some pathogen research is conducted in the U.S. without any federal oversight. Theoretically, a privately funded group could work on influenza virus in a makeshift laboratory and attempt to make the strain more deadly or more transmissible. If they're not using a select agent strain of flu and they are doing the research for peaceful purposes, there's no federal entity that could ensure that they are doing their work safely or securely or prevent them from continuing if safety or security is lacking. The U.S. needs a unified biosafety system that can provide oversight for research on all dangerous pathogens, regardless of the funding source or the affiliation of the researchers. Unlike other high-risk endeavors like aviation and nuclear power, biosafety does not have a robust research history because there has been nearly no funding for research in, the bio in biosafety over the past several decades. We currently lack data on how accidents occur or the factors that can effectively mitigate those accidents. Historically, biosafety improvements has always added on to existing equipment, procedures, or administration because there were no data suggesting which specific improvements were particularly effective versus others available. Investments in biosafety research can determine exactly what measures effectively reduce risk and which are simply theater, enabling the efficient use of research dollars across the United States. Using new evidence to eliminate wasteful measures would also make laboratories more sustainable as money need not be spent maintaining equipment with little value. Biosafety research can also directly inform laboratory practices on the choice of equipment and procedures that are inherently safer, improving safety in the near term. 
Data generated by biosafety research can also boost compliance with safer but inconvenient practices because scientists are naturally skeptical and data focused. Although there are general standards regarding safe practices for research, more standards are needed to cement and communicate best practices and ensure that the laboratories doing the least don't have an advantage over those taking more measures to be safe. For example, standards are needed to define how many biosafety professionals are needed to support research facilities of various sizes and complexities and what type of training is needed to work in containment. Developing these standards and templates for training would save all research facilities from developing their own. Also, the biosafety workforce is rapidly aging and experiencing burnout due to adopting extra duties to keep campuses and workplaces safe during the COVID pandemic. Fellowships, curricula, and training is needed to recruit scientists into the safety workforce and ready them for a career. Biosafety has historically been under-resourced for various reasons. In most institutions, biosafety staff are paid out of overhead costs instead of directly from research dollars, meaning that safety workforce draws resources out of the institution instead of paying for itself. As a colleague of mine has aptly said, biosafety has a soft money, soft jobs problem. Allowing the maintenance of safe labs as a direct cost on grants would help ensure biosafety is adequately supported. Moreover, in order to be properly implemented, any additional requirement put on the biosafety workforce, such as those recommended recently by the NSABB, should be accompanied by an increase in funding to ensure that biosafety professionals don't have to do more with the same resources, which itself could hamper safety. Regarding mission, currently there is no federal agency that is in charge of biosafety, funding biosafety research, promulgating specific biosafety standards, fostering the workforce, or providing oversight to all pathogen laboratories. To fix this issue, either an existing or new federal agency must be given the comprehensive mission of improving biosafety. Some have argued that the additional oversight of biosafety of the type I have described would stifle research. This position is belied by the fact that countries that have already implemented similar systems have equally robust pathogen research communities and bioeconomies. Specifically, Canada, Switzerland, Germany, and the UK all have comprehensive oversight of pathogen laboratories and several high containment laboratories. The resources needed to sponsor research, develop standards, foster the workforce is small compared to the resources spent on pathogen research itself. An annual budget of 60 million would provide sufficient funding to support this work, and this sum is approximately 1% of NIAID's 60, 66 billion annual budget. Uh, to close the oversight gaps I mentioned and adequately fund biosafety professionals to take on greater responsibility would require more funding, though the funding is clearly justified by the risks. The pandemic, which could have plausibly been caused by a laboratory accident, cost more American lives than all wars in my lifetime and harmed the economy more than any other single events. Investments on the scale of a single defense program would transform biosafety in the U.S. and more cost-effectively mitigate major risks facing the U.S. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding back and now recognize uh, Dr. Koblitz for his five minutes of opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the chance to speak with the committee today about biosafety, biosecurity, and dual use research oversight. Uh, I am uh, welcome the opportunity to present the results of the Global BioLabs Initiative, which I co direct with Philippa Lensos mm -hmm. at King's College London. We spent the last two years collecting and analyzing data on high consequence research facilities located around the world and evaluating the national biorisk management policies in place in these countries in order to um, oversee the safe, secure, and responsible operation of these facilities. Uh, in cooperation with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, we've created an interactive website at globalbiolabs.org that contains data on the locations and key characteristics of these BSL-4 and BSL-3 enhanced laboratories, as well as details on the biosafety, biosecurity, and dual use research oversight policies uh, that these countries have in place. Uh, today, I would like to present the key findings of our latest report, the Global Biolabs Report 2023, uh, which contains our most recent uh, research analysis on BSL-4 and BSL-3 labs, uh, as well as the state of biorisk management um, around the world. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, start off talking about uh, the BSL-4 labs, and then I'll talk about the BSL-3 enhanced labs, and then talk about the recommendations that we have. Um, since its launch in 2021, uh, the Global Biolabs Initiative has identified more than 100 high-consequence uh, biological research facilities meaning BSL-4 and BSL-3 labs uh, around the world with more uh, under construction and under development. Uh, among the BSL-4 labs, which are designed to uh, work with the most dangerous pathogens such as uh, Ebola, Marburg, and smallpox, um, there are um, currently 69 such labs 
uh, in operation under construction or planned in 27 countries. That's an increase of 10 labs from our last report in 2021. Um, today, um, of those labs, approximately 75% are located in urban areas, which exacerbates concerns if there was a uh, accidental release in one of these densely populated uh, areas. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to a building boom in BSL-4 labs. Uh, nine countries uh, have announced plans to build 12 new BSL-4 labs since the start of the pandemic. For five of these countries, this will be their first BSL-4 lab, and most of these new labs will be built in Asia, including Kazakhstan, the Philippines, India, and Singapore. Uh, turning now to the BSL-3 labs, we have identified 57 uh, of these Biosafety-3 enhanced laboratories in 28 different countries. These are BSL-3 labs that have adopted additional uh, biosafety and biosecurity measures in order to carry out uh, particularly risky research. The most common pathogen studied in these BSL-3 enhanced laboratories is highly pathogenic avian influenza. These labs have also been used to study uh, the 1918 um, pandemic influenza virus, as well as to conduct research on potential pandemic pathogens, uh, which is also known as gain-of-function research. 80% of the BSL-3 enhanced laboratories that we've identified are located in urban areas. However, there's limited national biosafety guidance and no international guidance about what constitutes a BSL-3 enhanced laboratory. In addition, there's been little to no research uh, done to determine whether the enhancements that these labs are using are commensurate with uh, providing commensurate level of uh, biosafety benefits compared to the riskier research that they're conducting. The Global Biolabs Initiative has also developed a new method for assessing the strength of biosafety, biosecurity, and Dooley's research oversight policies uh, that are used to conduct, uh, oversee the, the operations in these labs. Uh, we've collected this data on 27 countries that have or plan to have BSL-4 laboratories. Uh, let me discuss each of these in turn. Um, first, for biosafety, we've assessed that 21 of the 27 countries have scored high on biosafety governance. Uh, the weakest areas we identified were uh, lack of requirements for maintaining an inventory of pathogens uh, and for specifying the use of per uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we're doing less well on biosecurity. Only 12 of 27 countries with BSL-4 labs have received a high score for biosecurity. The biggest gap was in screening of DNA orders uh, related to um, sequencing and synthesis of dangerous pathogens. Only two countries have policies in place to screen orders to make sure that they are not being used to develop um, dangerous pathogens. Only 11 countries include cybersecurity as part of their biosecurity requirements, uh, and only 12 countries mandate that labs conduct biosecurity risk assessments. The picture is even worse when it comes to governance of dual-use research. Only one country, Canada, scores high in this category. Two other countries, including the United States, score medium, and the rest of the 24 countries we studied score low. Uh, among these low-scoring countries, many of them have a score of zero, meaning they receive no points for having any uh, mandatory or voluntary measures in order to conduct oversight of dual-use research in labs on their territory. Uh, with that review of the biorisk landscape, uh, let me offer some recommendations for concrete steps that we can uh, take to strengthen biorisk management. Uh, at the national level, all countries with high-consequence biological research facilities uh, should have whole government biorisk management systems, including comprehensive laws, regulations, institutions to uh, uh, enforce these, uh, these laws. States should also be developing national standards for field biosafety. So this is an area um, that has uh, received very little attention so far from the biosafety research community. And countries that don't have national biosafety associations uh, should uh, develop one with the support of their local biosafety and biosecurity professionals. Uh, internationally, the World Health Organization, the Biological Weapons Convention can also be leveraged to uh, increase uh, global biorisk management and improve transparency around these facilities. Uh, with that, let, let me just conclude and say that there are more countries building high containment laboratories, conducting uh, uh, riskier research with uh, potential pandemic pathogens, and developing dual-use biotechnologies. And our biorisk management oversight system is not yet caught up with this changing threat landscape. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Now recognize Mr. Pekish for his five minutes of opening statement. Committee Chair Rogers, Subcommittee Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Lesko, Ranking Subcommittee Member Castor, and all members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and devoting your time and effort to a topic that is important to our nation's public health. I'd like to state for the record that the opinions expressed here are my own and not necessarily reflect the views of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my name is Andrew Pekosh, and I'm a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm a virologist who has been doing basic research into viruses including influenza, SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, bunyaviruses, and hantaviruses for over 30 years. 
That research has been done at biosafety levels one, two, or three, depending on the agent and the type of experiment being used. In addition to my research interests, I've served on numerous review or advisory boards at the institutional, state, and national levels, all having been focused on establishing guidelines and biosafety recommendations that would allow critical research to move forward under the most appropriate biosafety conditions. I'd like to start by going through the current biosafety measures that are being used in laboratories. Uh, contrary to what is often described, scientists working with microbes across the United States pay a great deal of attention to biosafety. Keeping their laboratory workers safe is their top priority. Research with microbes undergoes numerous levels of scrutiny before being performed. Pathogen registration forms are reviewed by institutional biosafety committees, which disclose what experiments investigators plan to do and what agents they will be working with. Appropriate guidelines are set based on the organism being used and the type of experiment being proposed. Work in animal models involves additional reviews and worker training through animal care and use committees that assess what methods are being used and what alternatives are available to investigators. Work with human samples involves yet more training and reviews from institutional review boards that ensure that the privacy and safety of investigators and participants are given the highest priority. The availability of antivirals and vaccines is a critical part of the process of biosafety when they are available. Protocols for dealing with accidents are developed and make up a significant part of an individual's training. Uh, the vast majority of research with BSL-2 and BSL-3 pathogens occurs at the small scale and in ways that really do not pose an enhanced risk of infection to laboratory workers. Methods that generate aerosols or utilize needles or other sharp items are minimized or often non-existent. When there are clear needs for some of these techniques, extra precautions and training are put in place to maintain a safe working environment. Uh, there is an existing framework that targets pathogens with pandemic potential and research that involves potentially enhancing their disease-causing properties. This is the P3CO mechanism that was mentioned previously. It does lay out the process for identifying research of concern and how that research will be reviewed starting at the institutional level and progressing to the national level. The National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, or NSABV, recently released recommendations for updating guidance regarding research of concern. The NSABB's intentions were well-meaning, but the lack of clear definitions regarding the type of research and the agents which would be covered by the guidelines resulted in more, not less, confusion in the scientific community. The risks, this risk slowing our efforts aimed at current infectious diseases while not gaining additional protection from future pathogens. Their report did hit on several important items. Loopholes that allow certain experiments to avoid NIH review because it was funded by private sources need to be closed. Biosafety is independent of funding sources. Increased transparency about the review process and individuals making decisions about approving research of concern would also be welcome by most scientists in the field. In closing, I'd like to emphasize that the United States is the world leader in infectious disease research with the development of antimicrobials and vaccines being the centerpiece of those efforts. We have an opportunity to strengthen the leadership position and expand it to include biosafety and research into emerging and potential pathogens. The US has the engineering and manufacturing expertise to build effective, safe laboratories. It has the scientific, public health, and clinical expertise that can continue to drive forward and improve our abilities to respond to current and future outbreaks. The US can set the example of how to safely do research with clear public health benefits. This subcommittee will play an important role in determining that path forward, and I'm honored and grateful for the opportunity to provide my testimony in support of this initiative. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for his opening statement. Now I recognize Dr. Hawley for his five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Griffith, members of the committee, colleagues and friends. I'm going to address some of the issues that uh, have been mentioned. The origins of biological safety or biosafety was at the United States Army Biological Research Laboratories at Camp Dietrich, now known as Fort Dietrich in Frederick, Maryland, by Dr. Arnold G. Weedham, who was the Director of Industrial Health and Safety from 1946 through 1969. Dr. Weedham, who was revered as the person who was most responsible for creating our profession, is considered the father of modern biosafety. Through the efforts of Dr. Weedham, we saw the development of safer work practices, the biological safety cabinet, advances in aerobiological safety, and environmental monitoring. The development of biosafety concepts uh, has its roots in the work promoted by Dr. Weedham. The type of laboratory work, 
principles and practices used and the type of facilities needed were established on the uh, determination of risk. This was a risk-based approach. What I want to emphasize is that there is no one procedure or technique that can be used for all laboratory research and development procedures. Putting it bluntly, no one size fits it all. A risk assessment is conducted, followed by a risk management procedure, whereby the risk is mitigated or eliminated. Also implemented was a special procedure section that performed medical examinations on personnel assigned to work in the biowarfare sections and the special immunizations program that began as an immunization program to provide an additional measure of protection of laboratory workers against the occupational infections. Dr. Weedham directed many applied biosafety research projects that allowed us to better understand in the interaction of laboratory procedures and workers and subsequently be able to mitigate the negative impacts of these interactions. It is unfortunate that due to today, we do not continue to pursue applied biosafety research because of funding constraints. The recommendation of the Trans-Federal Task Force Report of 2009 develop and maintain a robust program of applied biosafety and biocontainment research to create additional and update existing evidence-based practices and technologies has not gained momentum. My experience at the United States Army program with the Medical Research and Development Command at Fort Detrick during the period 1988 through 2003 the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, or USAMRID, is, is the Department of Defense lay, lead laboratory for medical biological defense research. Yeah, USAMRID was my extended family. Everyone treated each other as family members. As an analogy, we were like spokes in a wheel, moving smoothly to accomplish our mission. That was research for the soldier protecting the warfighter from biological threats and also investigating disease outbreaks and threats to public health. We operated within an ideal climate of safety. Uh, everyone embraced and practiced culture of safety. During this time serving as biosafety officer at USAMRID, I was also designated command biological safety officer. In this role, I was tasked to inspect national and international contract and university laboratories to assess their capabilities and safety program prior to the release of fundings. This was an excellent example of command and control and also allowed me the opportunity to champion biosafety and learn alternative approaches to challenging situations and policies. Accidents, incidents, or mishaps in the laboratory or in any workplace environment do not just happen. They are caused, usually because of the unsafe behaviors of people. Included in the causes are violation of rules, procedures, inadequate training, failure to understand process or procedure, fatigue, and mental status. Most mishaps can be mitigated or eliminated through adequate coaching, mentoring, or training using the best practices for facilities, equipment, and procedures. I'm a firm proponent that we have an opportunity to gain experience from our incidents, mishaps, accidents, or near misses by sharing our experiences without negative consequences. Transfederal Trans Task Force, again, in 2009, proposed a centralized incident reporting analysis and information sharing system. The report further states that an analysis of report of laboratory incidents could help improve laboratory safety and oversight, determine why the accidents occurred and how they can be vented in the future. Implementing this recommendation will provide resources for generating and sharing lessons learning, promoting the need for new or revised guidelines, practices, or training. I have a few other things to mention, but because of the time constraints, I just wanted to mention lastly that uh, uh, the biosafety practitioner has to be enthusiastic about their work and recruit and be a cheerleader for the profession. And I hope that my comments will reveal the passion I have for biosafety and the continuing desire to learn from my colleagues. Thank you very much.
Thank you, and I appreciate the passion of all the witnesses. We'll now begin the question and answer portion of the hearing, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes for questions. Dr. Koblitz, if the NIH is not capable of enforcing or, doesn't, or isn't inclined to enforce safety standards at labs doing risky research, who would you recommend take on that responsibility? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think what uh, we need in this country is uh, an overhaul of the biosafety, biosecurity, and duties research oversight system, which would be best placed in an independent agency that would be able to uh, conduct that oversight, as well as conduct the kind of research that both Dr. Cascarani and Dr. Hawley uh, talked about being needed. Uh, this would be an organization similar to Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, or the, the FAA or the National uh, Transportation Safety Board. That would be an independent technical agency uh, that would have responsibility for those activities. Several of you indicated that there were uh, organizations that weren't connected with the NIH or even the U.S. federal government that were doing this type of research or might be doing this type of research. Would it be possible that we set something up that would be uh, not necessarily governmental or quasi-governmental that would be funded by those private organizations that are doing this type of research? Back to you. Uh, th that, that's certainly a possibility. Um, I mean, most of the the research is probably being conducted with public funding, but uh, again, as Dr. Casagrande mentioned, uh, there are um, gaps in the oversight system that would allow a private facility to engage in this research without any kind of oversight whatsoever. And so you'd want to have a comprehensive uh, oversight that would include uh, uh, facilities regardless of whether they're publicly funded or privately funded. I appreciate that. Um, we have incomplete data that suggests, and some of you all have suggested, that uh, there are accidents in the biosafety labs uh, that it's not necessarily such a rarity, but how do we start to get a more complete count of the number of accidents and incidents at high containment labs? Dr. Casagrande, do you want to start? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a good accounting of not just incidents that have occurred, but also the near misses would help us to learn from the incidents that inevitably will occur and prevent their repetition and also start studying their root causes and most effective ways to mitigate them. And you think we need federal legislation that indicates, I think both uh, you and Dr. Uh, Koblenz indicated, we need federal legislation that would require the labs, whether they be government or private, to report these near misses or accidents? A database that's missing a big portion of the data, that would be what's drawn from the, the private sector, would be less robust than one that contains all the data, obviously. And some of the research uh, environment in the private sector is different from the academic sector. For instance, their personnel uh, is much more stable. They don't have as much turnover as you do in academia. So they're probably going to suffer different risks. So cutting them out would not be adequate. All right. I appreciate that. Mr. Pico, uh, Picos. Uh, can you explain the necessity of progress reports when conducting research in biosafety laboratories? Uh, absolutely. I think it demonstrates progress of research. It demonstrates areas of research and directions of research. Oftentimes, directions of research do change from the initial proposal that was submitted, and progress reports are a great way for regulatory agencies, funding agencies, to keep track of how those changes are going forward and whether there was a major change in direction of research. And, and if we're missing progress reports, shouldn't we pause the study or the research until the progress reports can be uh, completed and evaluated? Yeah, progress reports are essential, I think, for monitoring research. So when you don't have them, you should put a stop to it. All right, Dr. Hawley, I understand that you reviewed some of the biosafety sections of the recently released Senate report, and you, and you were quoted in the Washington Post as saying that the Wuhan Institute of Virology had Im, imprudent laboratory practices, and it was very, very apparent that the Wuhan Institute of Virology's personnel's biological safety training is minimal. Is that correct, and can you expand? Yeah, that, that is my belief by reading some of the reports. Of course, I've never visited the facility, but based upon uh, the reports I've read and the approaches they had to implementation or developing biological safety equipment led me to believe that their training was, lacked, was less than perfect. And when you say that there was some equipment missing, you're talking about the uh, air incinerator that was not installed until late 2019? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's a real concern, isn't it? Uh, it is because the air incinerator technology was replaced by the HEPA filter in the 1950s, early 1960s. We had an air incinerator from our aerobiology building at Fort Detrick, and that was eventually closed down. 
again, because of the advent of the HEPA filter, not only that, because of the cost and maintenance involved. So they, were, they weren't doing anything, as I understand it, and then they, they put the air incinerator in, which was 1950s or 1960s technology when there was better technology available. Isn't that what you're saying? And yes, sir. Is, I believe yeah. that they implemented the air incineration because of uh, the lack of uh, uh, reliable data regarding the killing of organisms in their primary procedure, such as using an autoclave. Yeah. Kind of like shutting the barn door after the horse is already out. Move. Yeah. Yes, sir. I yield back to and now and now recognize the ranking member of the full. Oh, excuse me, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Castor, for her five yeah, minutes of thank questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, right off the bat, I wanted to to correct the record at the outset. Uh, the chair said that that uh, HHS had not replied to a request for on MPOX and here on April 26. 2023, they did have a three and a half page response to the committee that says at the outset, I want to respond specifically to the portion of your letter that described a September 22 science article that referenced a potential subproject, which you called the clay one study. This study has not been formally proposed and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases has no plans to move forward with this research, this type of research would require a formal proposal to be submitted for review and the proposal would need to undergo the rigorous review process described in this letter before it could be initiated. So I'm um, offer this for the record. And without objection is accepted for the record. Let me respond. We haven't started your five minutes yet, so I'm, I'm not eating up your time. Um, that, uh, that while we received that response almost six months after our initial request, uh, we still did not get an answer as to what their deliberations were. Clearly, they've now told us they weren't moving forward. The problem is, is that this is uh, not meaningful cooperation or meaningful input with the Committee of Jurisdiction, and accordingly, I stand by my opening comments. All right, back to you, Ms. Castor. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, well, we all share the goal that our labs at home and abroad must adhere to stringent safety standards to design uh, any thoughtful improvements from our perspective uh, as policymakers, we really need your, your input and, and advice. Uh, Dr. Pikash, your research involves working with infectious pathogens uh, to surveil and understand flu. You also oversee a high containment lab uh, used to study particularly infectious uh, viruses. Walk us through the steps uh, that you must take each time you enter a high containment lab to study an in infectious pathogen. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity to, to, to describe this. Um, I'll jump past the training, which is extensive. And oftentimes when a member joins my laboratory, for instance, it, it can be anywhere from, from a, a month to two months before they actually will go into our high containment laboratory because there's about a month or two of training that we do outside of the facility so individuals get comfortable with their techniques and their approaches. Um, our high containment laboratory has a security swipe where only limited individuals have access to the room. Um, the, it's a multi-room facility. Each of the doors have an interlock system so that only one door can be opened at any one particular time. And the outside door is only controlled by security access from the outside as well as um, uh, emergency or ex uh, security access from the inside. Uh, we enter an area in our room where, which we call our gowning room or our ante room. And that's the space that is pathogen free and that's where we gown uh, to enter into the rooms of our suite where we actually will be working with pathogens. Um, that, the, the gowning part involves us putting on a Tyvek oversuit, which is a, a moisture resistant protective barrier. We put on uh, protective gear over our feet. We put on a pair of gloves. We then down what's called an outer protective gown, which is another sort of apron that is moisture resistant. Uh, we put on a second set of gloves, and then we uh, provide protection through something called PPAR, uh, 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 or a PAPR unit. And what that is, is it's a unit where we put a, a, a hood around our entire heads, we connect it via hose to a unit on the side of our uh, uh, waist, which takes air from the room, purifies it through a HEPA filter, and then sends it through the mast out uh, and out the bottom of our so This mast. is a detailed uh, uh, yeah. process. Um, and uh, Dr. Koblenz, you, you said, okay, looking at it, the U.S. and Canada rank high 
when it comes to our fire risk management score. But then you highlighted the expansion of labs across the globe in uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is our best uh, way in America to make sure that that as labs open across the globe, what what's is it through the WHO? Is it through our research, uh, our collaboration? What is, what is the way to ensure that as labs open, they are adhering to high high standards? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think we need to take a, a kind of a two pronged approach. Um, working through organizations like the WHO and the Biological Weapons Convention can uh, enable us to set international standards for biosafety, biosecurity, and duties research oversight that that all countries can aspire to. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to have more focused efforts that are working with the countries that are uh, perhaps developing their first BSL-4 laboratory. And so they need to build up uh, the, the legal and regulatory um, infrastructure expertise, as well as the training for their um, personnel who'll be working there and making sure they're able to work there you know, safely and, and securely and engage that, provide the kind of training that Dr. Peshkov is, is talking about. And I think there are um, uh, not only bilateral programs the U.S. can, can do for that, but there are um, international organizations uh, like the International Federation of Biosafety Associations, the International Experts Group of Biosafety and Biosecurity Regulators that can provide those services as well uh, and make sure that labs are and operating. Here, here's at Here's my concern now because I've heard you've made some very important recommendations to us. Some, some say, oh, uh, create a new agency, some do some more oversight. But right now, uh, under the Republicans' default on America proposal, requires a 22 percent cut to NIH and significant cuts to the HHS Office of the Inspector General. That it would totally undermine the, those type of efforts and the, the ability to provide oversight. I mean, uh, uh, doc, my time's running out, but for, for the record, Dr. Crazzagrande, will you reply to us why funding NIH and its oversight mechanisms are so important and how uh, cuts of that magnitude would completely undermine our goals on biosafety in the U.S. and across the world? Thank you for the question, Representative Castor. Yes, my, I mean, my time is up, so I'm, you'll have to take that for the record. I, I don't understand. She's that. asking that you give a written response later to the question okay. because her time is, has sure. run out. Thank but you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back now. Recognize uh, the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I don't want to spend my time doing this, but the exchange you just heard is actu actually factually inaccurate. Uh, the appropriations that are done that will be delivered to the NIH, the CDC, all of those are yet TBD. There are no cuts that have been identified. There are overall savings in the budget that will occur over the next several years that are important because we are in a fiscal crisis, but that type of rhetoric does nothing to advance the, uh, the really what we're here to discuss today. I mean, Dr. Casagrand, you uh, actually <clears throat> answered my first question spontaneously. I, uh, I was going to ask which government entity is responsible for regulating high containment or risky research, and I think you already offered that there actually isn't one. Is that correct? Right. It depends on, it depends on what the, the uh, entity is researching, which pathogens, and also where its funding is derived from. But in for the highest level of containment, almost all, well, all of those pathogens are select agents, and so it would fall under the select agent program, either under the CDC or the USDA, so still two separate entities. But beyond that, it depends on if the agent is a select agent or if the funding is, is derived from a federal agency. If it's not a select agent and it's not uh, funded by a federal agency, then there might not be federal oversight. Well, l l let me ask, Mr. Pekosh, if I pronounce your name correctly. You identified uh, loopholes that need to be closed. Is is that along the line of, of what you were, were describing by closing loopholes? I think in your written testimony you say that it, you don't differentiate between, well, let me just be sure that I've got it correctly because it, I thought it was an important point that you made. Um, in, in, in reference to closing loopholes. Yeah, biosafety is independent of funding sources. Yes. That's essentially what I was saying. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really important point to make. Um, biosafety 
is a standard that is dependent upon the experiments you're doing, the pathogens you're working with, and the facilities that you have. Uh, we shouldn't be monitoring that or changing that, I should say, in any way based on simply where the money is coming from. And I think that's such a valid point. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Hawley, I really appreciated your historical uh, uh, reading of, of how things developed at, at Fort Detrick. Um, you know, I sat in a committee room here, it was probably 2013 or 2014. Well, I can remember reading as a medical student when smallpox was eradicated, right? In, in Ethiopia, they'd done the ring vaccinations, they'd isolated the last cases, we're gonna beat this disease, we're gonna wipe it off the face of the earth. And then to find out many, many years later, I'm elected to Congress and, uh, oh yeah, we still actually have some, some stuff. And then, after being on this committee for a while, we had a hearing because the NIH just happened to have some in the back of the fridge that no one knew about. So when you went through your, your recitation of the, of the historical development, uh, yeah, we, we, you can make mistakes. You can have near misses. And one of the things that really piqued my curiosity was you also said you have a system where it's what almost described as a no-fault system for reporting near misses. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And do you th well? Let's just explore that a little bit. Do you, is that something you think we can we can build upon that type of system, like at NASA? If you report. Uh, um, a near aeronautical disaster, you actually get a, a, a get a jail free card from the FAA because you properly reported it. it is that what you're talking about? Well, lo locally, we had a near miss reporting policy and then reviewed those near misses uh, periodically. But what I'm calling for, and I think some of my colleagues have mentioned, the need for a national database so that we can all share and learn from what happened without any negative consequences. There's a lot of punitive action associated with the reporting of an incident nowadays, and that has a tendency to drive these incidents underground so they're never reported. And same with the near misses, because of embarrassment or other right. reasons. And, or you don't want to end up in front of an administrative law judge somewhere with your with your credentials threatened. So I, I Mr. Chairman, I hope we can explore that concept. I know we're not a legislative subcommittee, but I, I think that is so important and the ability to have the database and to do so without penalty when the, when the proper reporting occurs. Maybe that could have avoided some of the difficulties that we see now with, with EcoHealth Alliance. But I, I really appreciate your testimony today. It's been a very yeah. instructive. And to emphasize that uh, some of my colleagues have made, that uh, monitoring should be done by an agency that does not provide the funding. Because that, to me, that's the analogous to the fox watching the hen house. Thank you. Important safety tip. Thank you, sir. And, and I suggest you lean over to your colleague to your uh, right who might have jurisdiction on the legislation. <laughs> I now recognize uh, Ms. DeGett of Colorado for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I really have to thank you for this panel. Um, the, the chairman knows I was the chair of this subcommittee the last four years. And, We've spent a lot of time talking about what to do about our labs, and I think all of you have really given us a lot of um, important food for thought. One of the, one of the issues that, that we have encountered, and one of the reasons why people are building these labs all around the world, it's important to do the research near where the, the, these viruses uh, occur. Is that, Mr. Pecos, you're, you're nodding your head yes. Yeah, there, there is such, especially when it comes to emerging infectious diseases and outbreaks, um, having the boots on the ground, having the local authorities not only be well prepared, but having the facilities that can deal with this is incredible because that's the way you can stop these outbreaks early. Right. Once outbreaks get too out of control, it becomes incredibly difficult to do it. that. That's right. So, so um, uh, Dr. Koblenz, everybody is focusing on you and what you're talking about, the biosafety protocols and so on, and, and you talked about the WHO and some of the other organizations that could oversee it. But, but a question that I have is, when the U.S. is entering into partnerships with some of these countries, um, we could make a condition of our, of our funding and our joint action 
uh, that they meet certain protocols and also transparency. Wouldn't that be fair to say? Yes, that, that would be a, a good approach to take when we're working with other labs and helping them build their, their capacity to also make sure that they have in place the right biosafety and biosecurity protocols. If they want to work with our scientists, which they all want to work with our scientists and get our money, right? Yes. And, and um, so, so uh, let's see. What, what would happen, Dr. Peckles, if, if we had a ban on some of the international research collaborations, as some of my colleagues on the other side have talked about, not, not this colleague, but other ones? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it is incredibly important to have epidemic and outbreak research be created and shared in near real time. And those resources oftentimes, requ those require multinational resources. Um, I run a center that actually does do surveillance both in Taiwan and, and in Zambia. And the importance of being on the ground there, training people, having a free flow of information, establishing trust networks between individuals are all critical in terms of uh, uh, being able to do these things effectively. Now, now, Ms. thank you. Mr. Holly, you, you talked about the laps, lapses at the Wuhan lab, but you haven't actually seen those lapses for yourself. You read about it in a report, isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay, so, so so the problem is, and this is the problem the chairman's talking about, I, and I just read an article in the New York Times the other day about this, China is not transparent in what is going on at its labs. So that's what we have to try to figure out what to do with China, but also other countries too, so we can be assured that the highest levels of lab safety are met and so that we can make sure that we don't have that we're we're not sitting around here three years later trying to figure out where the virus came from, and that's that's really the goal. So, Dr. Casagrande, I've got um, a little bit of time left, and so I wanted I don't want to be partisan about this, but I do want to give you the opportunity to answer in front of everybody and on the record why funding the NIH and its oversight mechanisms are so important. And if we did have cuts, what that might do to our ability to monitor these labs. Yeah, if you look at human progress over the last century, a lot of it has been due to biomedical advances. And the NIH is probably the premier institution in the world that has fostered those advances and led to the great expansion of life expectancy, quality of life, and reduction of childhood mortality. Additionally, if you look at the COVID pandemic, had this uh, pandemic happened 10, 15 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to respond as quickly and get back to life as normal and to have our economy recover as fast as it did. So also, you know, because of the issue I mentioned that the biosafety jobs are often funded on soft money, cuts on research will probably be hit somewhat hardest on safety staff. And so uh, you might end up accidentally creating a less safe environment from that purpose. And Conversely, it, more funding, sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. I was going to say, we see the same thing with food safety. Mm -hmm. uh, and this subcommittee's looked a lot at food safety, too, because when you have our food being produced in China, you have to have the inspectors go over there. But frequently, that's one of the first things that gets cut because it's seen as fungible. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. Now recognize the chairman of the Health Subcommittee, Mr. Guthrie, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for you all being here today. I appreciate it. And uh, so, Dr. Klobitz, the first question. Um, on the topic of high containment labs, the December 2022 omnibus spending law included a provision requiring the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to develop a strategy for maintenance and coordination of biosafety levels three and four labs that are federally owned and operated. Uh, you're familiar with this provision and support it? Yes, I am. Uh, so the question was, uh, what is the current status of the implementation of this provision, and how would this help protect our biosecurity in these facilities? Uh, I, I'm not aware of the, the status of that review process, but I will speak uh, generally about the, the need for a comprehensive review of the adequacy of our facilities at the BSL-3 and BSL-4 level, um, especially in light of our experience with COVID, uh, in light of, um, you know, MPOX and the other emerging effects diseases that we see, there, there needs to be now a more um, rational conversation and review within the government to understand what are our, our capabilities and what are our gaps um, and what are areas maybe that are excessive and, and don't need to be 
in place any longer. And I think we've been growing this infrastructure for so long among multiple different agencies that we haven't had that kind of comprehensive um, government-wide review. So I, I do think it, it, it's time for that uh, to happen. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Casagrande, um, the omnibus only specified that this provision would apply to federally owned labs and operate, federally owned and operated. I know you talked a little bit about this in your opening statement. Would it be helpful to expand this provision and any requirements developed in response to private labs as well? Would it be uh, helpful and, and also would it be appropriate to do so? Yes, I mean, as was mentioned uh, by my other panelists, that biosafety is independent of, of the funding source. It really depends on what are the uh, manipulations you're doing, what's the pathogen you're working on. And so it, it doesn't make any sense to have such large gaps in oversight, support, guidance, et cetera. Hey, thank you, and Dr. Klobitz, I know you're familiar with this because you authored the report. So I want to ask you a question on the, the BSL-4 laboratories a group of international researchers you mentioned, led by King's College London researcher that you participate in, published the Global Biolabs Report 2023, which noted the number of BSL-4 labs across the globe grew from 69 to 69 across 27 countries in 2022, up from 59 in 2021. So uh, we mentioned that already, but the, the report further notes the key trend is that the, the number of labs handling dangerous pathogens is rapidly increasing around the world, but the boom has not been accompanied by sufficient oversight and raises biosafety and biosecurity concerns. So the question, um, as we look to ensure greater maintenance, coordination, and oversight of biosecurity research, how do we ensure we are promoting and requiring similar standards internationally, particularly at those facil facilities which we're partnering or providing funding? Uh, thank you for the, the question. Um, th there is an international standard for bio-risk management called ISO 35001. Uh, that could be adopted by labs uh, around the world, whether they are BSL-2, BSL-3, BSL-4. Uh, these are standards that uh, require labs to put in place a management system to ensure they're prioritizing biosafety and biosecurity. So there is a very um, readily available standard that could be adopted. Uh, what we haven't really seen is the resources being put into uh, educating labs about this, providing the training, providing the incentives for labs uh, to do this. And certainly, uh, the U.S. government could uh, do that by uh, making that a condition of working with labs in, in terms of capacity building or, or training that we're doing for public health purposes uh, or for, um, uh, you know, our biosecurity engagements. Um, we could be making more of an effort to ensure that these labs ha are adopting these standards uh, and working through international organizations like the WHO uh, to try and uh, make that standard more of a universally adopted uh, a protocol within these labs. I think that would provide a, a, a baseline that would definitely improve the level of biosafety and biosecurity. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Peskoff or Dr. Holly, would you like to comment on the, what a question that we just talked about? You have a, I like Dr. Peskoff, you got, you got a quick uh, comment? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I think, you know, scientists around the world talk to each other about these kind of things. Um, the organization of this becomes a political and, and, a, and a national discussion that really has to involve other parties. But I think there's willingness among scientists to talk to each other internationally about this. Dr. Holly? Yes, I, I like to go back to the root of the situation. I think what we need is an oversight organization to look at the laboratories in the United States. Composition of that organization should include some laboratory workers some people from the community, analogous to the membership on an IBC. And I think when you have this oversight, then you can start adding ISO 35001, as other people have mentioned, or other standards. Uh, well, we really don't have any standards in biosafety, to the best of my knowledge. We have guidelines, the biosafety and microbiological and biomedical laboratories, that textbook, so to speak, is a risk-based approach to determine what kind of facilities, equipment, or procedures you use for the type of work. So okay, to me, an oversight committee or an oversight organization to look at research in the United States would yeah. probably fill a lot My of My time's work. expired, so I was gonna... Thank you for that. Thank you. I'll gentlemen, yield back, Mr. Gentlemen, yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Chair Griffith and uh, Ranking Member Castor for hosting this hearing, and I thank our witnesses for joining us today and sharing their expertise. The issue of lab safety is indeed an extremely important one and worth today's uh, discussion. I greatly value the work of our nation's scientists uh, conducting research vital to uh, protecting public health 
and I appreciate the need for vigilance in ensuring that uh, our labs are operated safely, ethically, and uh, certainly responsibly. However, I remain concerned that basic science has become so politicized that we can't have a reasoned conversation on how to protect the public from disease without delving into unsupported conspiracies or unfounded allegations about what scientists are doing in America's labs. So, Dr. Pekosh, in your experience, have reasonable discussions over topics like lab safety become more difficult in recent years due to politics? Uh, I think they have. I think uh, institutions um, remain vigilant. I think the laboratory workers remain vigilant, but sharing this information to the general public um, has met with um, some pretty harsh responses in many cases. And under the guise of transparency, I think there is a duty for our scientists to really communicate to the general public what we're doing and how safe it is. But some of the responses to those initial things have really been uh, quite uh, disturbing. And I think that causes scientists to really then go back into their shell and talk among themselves more, and again, not communicate out to the general public, which again is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right, in terms of then having mistrust or, 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 or uh, 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 lack of trust in those entities when there's no communication. Thank you, and I certainly believe that what we do here in policy format needs to be science-based and evidence-based. Absolutely critical, that that be the uh, given situation. So Dr. Koblenz and Dr. Casagrande, you both stated in a recent New York Times op-ed that pathogens do not care about politics and that we need to forge an informed bipartisan path forward. You also wrote that even though the weight of the evidence on COVID-19's origins points to an animal-to-human jump, we nonetheless should use the pandemic as an opportunity to examine current lab safety protocols. While agree with, I agree with that sentiment, it sometimes seems like some of my Republican colleagues continue to conflate legitimate issues about lab safety with allegations that some renowned scientists are somehow covering up the origins of COVID-19. So Dr. Koblenz, why is it important that we move forward with the conversation about lab safety in a politically neutral and evidence-based way? Uh, even if this uh, pandemic had no linkage to any, any laboratory, we know the possibility exists that work with either a, um, you know, a naturally occurring virus that's brought back into the lab for characterization and understanding its, its risks uh, to the kinds of um, uh, work with potential pandemic pathogens that have been conducted previously, right, could result in an accident. Um, and the fact that we know that is a possibility means we need to be doing more to try and reduce that risk and prevent the possibility from, from happening. Uh, and the fact that um, we can't rule out the role of the ones who do virology should also um, provide an incentive for us to have better standards and oversight and transparency on these kinds of labs, not just in China, but, but in the U.S. and around the world. So I think for all those reasons, this is an important topic to be addressing regardless of the specifics of the, the controversy you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Casagrande, would you want to add to that uh, concern? Yes, I think much like uh, Three Mile Island uh, kind of transformed our thinking about nuclear power and a series of aviation disasters, transformed our thinking about uh, aviation safety. Uh, I think this, this uh, pandemic, like Dr. Koblenz said, uh, just illustrates the potential consequences of, a, of an accident, even if it had no laboratory origin. And because the consequences can be so dire, investments in preventing those consequences uh, on the order of aviation or nuclear power are definitely warranted. And that's not a political question. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hawley, in your testimony, you're right that reports on lab incidents must be, and I quote, characterized by openness and engagement by all individuals. And you also share that one of the best ways to reduce risks of an accident is by developing productive relationships with scientists. How can the politicization of science and maligning of scientists get in the way of efforts to improve biosafety? Well, personally, I've spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union countries <clears throat> uh, looking at laboratories being funded by the Department of Defense in order to redirect some of the efforts of the former biological warfare scientists. And I have found that the development of interpersonal relationships, communications, and trying to earn the individual's trust and enhance transparency. And I think it, be, it, be, it begins with the development 
and sustainment and nurturing of interpersonal relationships. And to me, that's most important. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, organisms do not have any political affiliation at the present time. Okay, we're there. Um, I thank you. And with that, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. McMorris Rogers, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Koblitz, uh, the United States scored nine out of 10 on dual use research governance, while China scored zero. That's obviously concerning given, given the dual use research on pathogens as obvious military applications. Can you explain what factors led to the differences in those scores? Uh, certainly. So um, the United States scored, I think, uh, five out of 10 um, because our primary mode of oversight is through the um, NIH review of dual use research and, and uh, through the, the DERC policy and through the P3CO um, framework. And so, um, and the United States also does uh, awareness building activities through the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. And we have local stakeholder groups like the American Society for Microbiology that have codes of conduct and codes of ethics that govern uh, the, the research being done by their scientists. So those factors are what gave the U.S. the score it got for Dewey's research um, oversight, which is um, better than most countries, but still uh, not, not a perfect score by any means. Uh, in, in contrast, China doesn't have in place now uh, any um, meaningful oversight of dual-use research. There is on the, the books a biosecurity law from 2020 that calls for the development of such a system within China, uh, but those regulations have not yet been promulgated within China, and so there's no active oversight over the research that's being done to monitor and oversee it and whether or not it is um, poses any dual-use risks or not. Um, uh, so I do hope that that will be forthcoming. Uh, in the near future, and um, we will certainly update our report when, when we, we do it next if, if China and the U.S. make progress in those areas. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Uh, Dr. Casagrande, uh, for risky research involving dangerous pathogens, why is more transparency about biosafety standards and communicating best biosafety practices important? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, the communication of best practices is important because each lab has very uh, has thought leaders who are carefully considering the risks that they that they face, and has implemented particular mitigations to address all those risks and make them as minimal as possible. This is often due to the creative thought and careful effort of these individuals, and it, though it's created to address risks that they've found personally in their laboratories those same mitigations could be beneficial uh, in many, many institutions, but people don't think of sharing those innovations and best practices. So understanding those and communicating those would enable everyone to benefit from them instead of reinventing them over and over again. It would be a much more efficient use of labor. Thank you. Would you speak to how it may benefit the public, more transparency and communication? Sure. Uh, the sharing of these best practices would benefit the public by, one, making sure our tax dollars are best spent on doing the actual research as opposed to mitigating the risks of the research, and um, two, making labs across the United States safer without actually uh, having to, um, you know, do trainings or anything like that. It would be just communicating all the great work that's already been done inside these containment labs. Would you speak, would you give us your thoughts on what aspects of lab operations, lab safety uh, could be made more transparent? Could be made more transparent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, specific, like what aspects of the operations? In the uh, sure. Well, I think the, the public, as was mentioned on this, on this panel, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the public appreciates the great effort that is going on already, how much effort is spent on uh, emergency response protocols, how much effort is spent on medical surveillance, how much effort is spent on if there is an exposure, what those workers do. In addition to all of the engineering controls and equipment that's spent, people often conflate the concept of an incident in the lab to an outbreak. And in fact, there's an incident that could occur, and the vast majority of those are mitigated by the equipment and procedures in place and don't result in an infection. But if an infection were to occur, there's a lot of procedures in place to isolate the worker and monitor them so that they don't necessarily infect anyone else. So only a very tiny minority of workplace infections lead to secondary infections. And so I think because there is a uh, lack of awareness on all the different measures that exist inside U.S. laboratories, I think people often think that 
uh, for you start at spilling a flask and then instantly you have a pandemic. And there's many, many steps in between those two that are mitigated by all the measures already in place. So it sounds like the increased transparency could play a role in actually improving lab safety also. Uh, yes, especially the public's uh, perception of lab safety. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's a good appreciation of all the efforts that are currently in place. Okay, thank you. Thank you all again for being here. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Now recognize the Chairman of the Energy Subcommittee, Mr. Duncan of South Carolina, for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think when we talk about transparency, the Chinese government was not transparent about um, what happened in Wuhan. And I was amazed to hear Mr. Tonko talk about uh, conspiracy theories. During the pandemic, uh, things that were dubbed as conspiracy theories by the left were actually proven to be correct in the long run. Um, the Wuhan virus was uh, originated in Wuhan, China. Whether it was natural or man-made doesn't matter. Um, U.S. tax dollars did go to fund uh, grants at the Wuhan lab for gain-of-function research. And that was a conspiracy theory before, and now it's been proven. So over and over and over, and I just want to push back on that. Dr. Koblenz, a year ago today, you presented a, at a meeting held at NIH about oversight of research with potential pandemic pathogens. A section of your written statement dealt with the mishandling of the EcoHealth Alliance proposal on grant. You noted EcoHealth's research project included in vivo experiments at the Wuhan Institute of Virology to determine the risk of wild bat-related coronaviruses spilling over into human populations. Hey, we saw that. Um, this proposal was flagged by the NIH program officers potentially involving research covered by the two 2014 grant of gain-of-function funding pause. NIH included a requirement in the EcoHealth grant that, quote, that if any of the chimeric viruses generated under the grant showed evidence of enhanced virus growth greater than 10 times that of the original virus from which they were created, the grantee must immediately stop all experiments with these viruses and provide the NIH and the Wuhan Labs Institutional Biosafety Committee with the re relevant data and information related to these unanticipated outcomes. So wasn't the inclusion of the excessive virus growth policy a tacit admission that uh, by the NIH that such research could be reasonably be anticipated to produce a virus with enhanced virulence or transmissibility, even if it was unexpected or unintended? Yes or no? Yes, I, I do think it could have been reasonably anticipated. Okay. Um, was it the proper course of action for NIH to take was to refer this proposal to the, NI, N, to the HHS P3CO review group to assess the risk and benefits of the research and recommended, recommend how NIH should proceed with the grant? Yes or no? I think that would have been the, the appropriate method would have been to review, uh, forward that proposal to the department-wide review. I take that as yes. Uh, but the NIH did not make such a referral, isn't that correct? Correct. Uh, would you agree that NIH failed to properly monitor the conduct and outcomes of this research? Yes. In year four of the EcoHealth grant, the Wuhan lab conducted this experiment with humanized mice infected with chimeric coronaviruses, and there was excessive virus growth. EcoHealth did not stop the experiment and did not immediately notify the NIH as required under the grant terms. Even worse, EcoHealth Alliance did not halt this research as required since uh, it reported in its year five annual progress report that, quote, we continued with the in vivo infection experiments of diverse bat SARS-related coronaviruses on transgeneric mice expressing human ACE2, ACE2, uh, unquote. Doesn't this raise uh, serious questions about EcoHealth's compliance with grant rules and show a breakdown of NIH uh, oversight responsibilities over such experiments of a concern? Yes, it calls into question implementation of the, the grant. So there were failure for oversight of the grant. Uh, research was done on uh, coronavirus that uh, in mice that could be transmitted to humans. Uh, there were a lot of mistakes made, and um, I appreciate your forthcoming with that. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Appreciate his questions. And now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, according to an excerpt from uh, reporter Allison Young's new book, uh, Pandora's Gamble, a researcher from the University of Wisconsin nearly contracted a uh, lab-created bird flu virus. I think that was in December 2019. The researcher was accidentally exposed and potentially, uh, to potentially contaminated air. And what concerns me is that according to Ms. Young's reporting, the state and local health officials weren't notified about the accident. And I, I really think this is part of what, what we need to address in terms of oversight 
uh, and and more rigorous controls is that that not only we want to make sure we don't have an accident like this, but if one does occur, we don't sit on it. Um, so I'd like uh, for your response to that uh, from from each of you, if you, if you don't mind. I, I'll be happy to respond, um, Representative Palmer. Um, so I think one of the things that we've noticed in, in um, work with containment labs across the U.S. is that they have uh, different protocols for what happens after uh, an exposure. Uh, and once again, this is partially because of a lack of sharing of innovations or best practices. In some cases, every worker is given a card that they can present to the medical system when they're exposed to an extremely unusual virus that the, that that practitioner might not have ever seen in their life about treatments, about risks, et cetera. And then they can present that card directly uh, when they present to the medical system. And that's an innovation that's not copied everywhere. And the reason why it's not copied everywhere is it hasn't been in implemented into best practices or standards yet, nor communicated. There's also different rules about how you isolate at home and what flu watch looks like, uh, how often you take your temperature. Um, and so these are the exact types of things that better uh, quote unquote standards or guidance could focus on more specific uh, guidance and standards. In the article that uh, you and your colleague, uh, Dr. Koblitz, wrote, you, you talked about uh, that the U.S. has taken a, a reactive and haphazard approach preventing lab accidents and uh, misuse of high risk science. But I, that's part of my concerns about what happened um, in uh, Wisconsin. But you also made the point that the U.S. has more labs than any other country. Uh, does the U.S. have have these labs that are not located in the United States? You, you know, if when you talk about the U.S. has more labs, are they all located in the United States, or do we have labs elsewhere? Uh, all, all the labs we um, cover in our report, um, which are BSL-4 and BSL-3 enhanced labs, um, th th these are all U.S. labs that are in the, United, in the United States of America. The United States does have uh, labs overseas, but they are not in this category uh, of BSL-4s or BSL-3 enhanced that, that are part of this report. Okay. Um, but, but given your concerns about research in the U.S., and I, I had to step out, so I may have missed some of this, Mr. Chairman, but do you also have concerns about U.S. funding uh, through grants or sub-grants in, in the oversight that is applied uh, to the labs where those grants or subgrants uh, go. Yeah, I, I would like to see um, the U.S. apply the same standards for biosafety and biosecurity that we have here with laboratories that we're working with overseas. Um, that might not be, you know, different countries have different biosafety and biosecurity mm -hmm. rules, and this is one of the issues that becomes kind of complicated when you're trying to foster international collaborations. Uh, so it would be uh, advantageous to try and harmonize those biosafety and biosecurity uh, standards in order for us to facilitate international cooperation. But overall, I think it's the use advantage to uh, use our grants and, and collaborations as a way to try and uh, in increase the level of biosafety and biosecurity that, and the labs we're working with overseas. Well, it would help, it would help us do that if we had um, a really rigorous uh, set of, of oversight guidelines and that we could implement. And I mean, you, you talked about the National Science Advisory um, board for biosecurity unanimously approved uh, uh, some some safeguards that I assume haven't been implemented. They've um, unanimously approved the recommendations that have gone to the right. White House, um, and they're yeah. they're being considered there. But it will be up to the um, you know the executive branch with the the cooperation of of Congress to actually implement the recommendations. Well, the main proposed. point I'd want to make, Mr. Chairman, is that that this board unanimously approved these these guidelines, and and I think that's that's where we need to to really focus right now for for upgrading our our biosecurity and and maybe having something rigorous enough that can be applied uh, through the grants and subgrants. I appreciate that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll notify everybody that votes have been called. We're going to try to get our last two folks in before that happens uh, or before we have to leave and, uh, so that everybody doesn't have to wait for us to come back. 
Mr. Ruiz is now recognized for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much. Uh, as ranking member of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, we've been looking at this very issue. So how, like the issue of how do we balance safety with the necessity of robust scientific research so that we can prevent and respond to public health emergencies like the COVID pandemic. Uh, hopefully we can all agree that lab safety is essential and that there are ways to accomplish a safe lab environment without stifling breakthroughs in innovation and scientific discovery. I appreciate the testimony of our witnesses for highlighting some ways that we might accomplish those complementary goals. So, Dr. Casagrande, one uh, suggestion that you proposed in your testimony is to make sure that privately funded labs doing work with certain pathogens are subject to similar oversight requirements as publicly funded ones. Can you explain the importance of uniformity and transparency in lab safety guidance irrespective of funding sources? Yes, as was uh, mentioned by the other uh, panelists, uh, the, the, the risks are independent of the funding source. It relates to the experiments that are being done and the pathogens studied. Also, it, it's, it helps level the playing field. The unif unification of standards helps make sure that the labs that are doing the most to be safe, and there's many, many safe labs within the U.S., Aren't, don't, have, don't have a competitive disadvantage to the labs that are skating by. And so standards and uniform standards that apply universally help level the playing field and ensure that the safest labs aren't disadvantaged. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pekosh, as someone working directly in a lab setting, uh, do you agree that there should be one set of biosafety rules that everyone follows? Absolutely. I think that uh, funding sources should not play a role in terms of setting biosafety guidelines. Um, I do feel that biosafety guidelines need to be very clear and precise because there is an area where research with viruses such as influenza, something that's a common uh, concern, might be conflagrated with research on viruses like Ebola virus. And it's important to note that there are very distinct differences between what we want to do in terms of our biosafety and how we want to uh, monitor for those types of experiments. You know, in addition to that, I'm concerned that some of the bans and moratoria on research using infectious pathogens that have been proposed by some of my Republican colleagues do not adequately strike the balance that we need between mitigating risk while making sure we stay well positioned in safe labs to achieve scientific breakthroughs. Uh, so, Dr. Pekosh, do outright bans on research using infectious pathogens strike the right balance between the risks and rewards of infectious disease research? Absolutely not. I mean, not only do they slow progress of research, but they have ripple effects. Uh, trainees that come through the laboratory are less likely to be interested in this type of research uh, because they hear stories about people's research being paused, a PhD student not being able to finish their research because of a, of, of a pause that's been implemented. And that has ripple effects on their ability to want to go into this area and, and train. And I think we know from the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to strengthen our public health infectious diseases workforce. Uh, we can't have people leaving them or being hesitant to go into that. We've seen the benefits that that so has. Can you share some examples of proposals for lab safety improvements that from from your perspective, adequately weigh the risks of certain research against public benefits and describe why they strike that balance correctly? I think it's important to note that once, an, once, an, once a pathogen and a technique has been uh, allocated a certain level of biosafety, um, that provides a large level of security for an individual. Um, experiments that are then done in those areas already carry with it a high level of security and a high level of safety. I think we have to realize that, that oftentimes the bar is set very high at the beginning, and when we see things later on that are happening, sometimes this gain-of-function research is, is considered that. Um, oftentimes they still fall underneath the safety considerations that um, are good to protect the individuals that are working you know, there. Let me ask you another question that I, I'm grappling with as ranking member of the other committee is that, you know, we, how do we build the relationships or the influence, uh, the incentives or accountability structures to ensure that there's lab safety in other countries and some countries that may not be uh, such allies with us, one. And two is um, uh, uh, it, those countries may very well continue with these other type of research uh, despite what the U.S. does, which may put us at a vulnerable position in the future if we ever need to investigate a, a virus that another country has investigated further. 
So how do we build the international uh, structures to make sure that labs are safe all around the world? Uh, it's a challenging question, but I would, I would say it starts with the scientists. The scientists communicate with each other quite well, quite effectively. If you start with that and build the consensus as to what needs to be important, what's important to be done, you can then work through the political system to try to get that uh, implemented and uh, across board. Thank you. Gentleman yields back now. Recognize uh, the gentlelady vice chair of the uh, subcommittee from Arizona, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to say thank you to you, Mr. Chair, because this is such an important issue. And I want to th say thank you to all of you um, because. Uh, it's absolutely vital that we um, pay attention to this issue. Um, you know, my question kind of relates to what Dr. Ruiz was talking about, but I'm, I'm going to um, ask it of Dr. Hawley. In 2014, the Obama administration paused funding for gain-of-function research due to the risk and safety incidents at federal laboratories that year. Then the NIH resumed funding in 2017 for gain-of-function experiments. Uh, shortly after, uh, NIH, as we've all talked about before, awarded a grant of this type to EcoHealth Alliance. Around $600,000 of that grant went to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, as you know, COVID-19 happened. We've had different hearings. It seems more likely than not to me that COVID-19 came from a lab leak from the Wuhan lab. Dr. Redfield, the former CDC director, um, has testified, thinks that there were gain-of-function research that was going on there and that we partially funded it. Um, and Dr. Redfield actually told uh, the other subcommittee that I'm on and the COVID Select Subcommittee that he thinks we should put a pause on gain of function enhanced potential pandemic pathogen uh, research um, until we know, uh, till we have a broader discussion of it, until we have more biosafety in place. What do you think? It's just my opinion, ma'am, but I agree with your comments, and uh, I think it's most important to uh, uh, have an oversight group to take a look at this. Uh, there are gain-of-function experiments that are very beneficial, and we have to have the appropriate panel of individuals, scientists, and lay members to look at that and evaluate that and based upon uh, keep repeating myself, the risk-based approach to see whether or not it will be beneficial. But I think, I think we, we do need some sort of oversight, and there's no question about that. And, and since it sounds like, from what all of you said, there is no centralized location in the federal government for oversight and that some private uh, labs don't have any oversight, should we, do you think, pause this very enhanced, um, I call it E triple P, uh, um, research until we get the biosafety um, apparatus in place. Yes, but I, again, I emphasize the fact that we do need to start with oversight. Yeah, okay. And we were trying that. There, there is precedent for not only oversight, but community involvement with the Boston Public Health Commission, the liaison with the, the people in the community. They know what's going on. The Containment Laboratory Community Advisory Committee in Frederick, Maryland has an in, has a interaction between the laboratories of Fort Detrick and the community members, whereby we can openly have transparency, ask questions, publish near misses, and so forth. So. To me, that's a form of oversight and gaining uh, the respect uh, from the community. Thank I you. And, I, and my last question is for you too, Doc, uh, Mr. Hawley. Um, you had mentioned uh, earlier in your testimony that you don't think a federal agency that provides grants 
for bioresearch should be the same one that's in charge of overlooking biosafety. I think that's what you said in so many words. Is that accurate? And uh, it, are, are you talking about the NIH? That's my question. I'm not going to name any organization, but the, 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 the bottom answer to your question is, is yes. I know uh, when I was at Fort Detrick as a command biosafety officer, we had labs internationally, and it was my job to go out and look and monitor those labs. So uh, we did have oversight, even though we did provide funding. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Great uh, communication, great information, I should say. Thank you. And I thank back. I thank the gentlelady for yielding back. If there are no further members wishing to ask questions, I would like to thank all of our witnesses again for being here today. In pursuant to committee rules, I remind members they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to submit their response within 10 business days upon receipt of the questions. I further, in compliance with committee rules, would remind uh, Special Advisors uh, Kennedy and Jack that uh, they may receive test questions, and we do expect those answers within 10 business days as well. That being said, without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned. Yeah, no, you, you guys first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can actually. Nope, I just get down a little. Uh, oh, you lost the yeah. yeah. yeah.